السادس الموافق الرابع إلى السادس جماد الأول فقط وحصريا على قناة ديوان تابعوا معنا تغطية مباشرة لمنتدى جدة الاقتصادي في الأوقات التالية السبت من الثامنة مساء وحتى العاشرة والنصف ليلا الأحد من الواحدة ظهرا وحتى السادسة والنصف مساء الاثنين من الواحدة ظهرا وحتى السادسة والنصف مساء منتدى جدة الاقتصادي 2013 يأتيكم برعاية قناة ديوان رصد مستمر ومباشر لنشعة الأعمال للقطاع الخاص في مجال تمويل الإسكان سيدير هذه الجلسة السيد ديفيد سميث المؤسس لمؤسسة الإسكان بأسعار معقولة من الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وسيشارك فيها كل من سعادة الشيخ صالح عبد الله كامل رئيس مجلس إدارة الغرفة التجارية والصناعية بجدة ورئيس المنتدى أيضا الدكتور سعيد بن عبد الله الشيخ نائب الرئيس التنفيذي وكبير الاقتصاديين في البنك الأهلي التجاري والسيد بلوبي كيرتانافاج النائب الأول لرئيس بنك الإسكان بحكومة تايلاند ومدير البحوث وإدارة خدمات المعلومات وأيضا السيد فيلغاندر فيلغاندر رئيس قسم خدمات استشارات الأعمال في شرق الأوسط وشمال إفريقيا في شركة أرنست أند يونغ فقط نشير إلى أن هذه الجلسة ستعرض على قناة ديوان وكذلك الجلسات المتبقية لهذا اليوم أترك الميكروفون الآن للسيد ديفيد سميث In the last session we heard about the uh, development side of the equation how you create new housing This panel is about the finance side of the equation, how you fund the housing. Um, and it seems to me the simplest thing to do is to yield the floor to Sheikh Salah. All yours. Go. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, alladhi ja'al al-zakah الركن الثالث في الإسلام ليكون هو الرقيب علينا في أداء هذا الركن المالي الهام الذي وإن كان ركنا تعبديا فهو كذلك لأهميته الاقتصادية فالزكاة يا إخواني خطة اقتصادية متكاملة للأسف لم نفهمها في هذا العصر ولم نطبقها التطبيق السليم الذي يحقق الأغراض التي أرادها الله سبحانه وتعالى من وراء هذا الركن المهم فالزكاة تتدخل في موضوع الإسكان والزكاة تتدخل في موضوع تخطيط المدن لأنه لو طبقناها ولو اعتبرنا هذه الملايين من الأراضي المملوكة البيضاء عروض تجارة وهي حتما عروض تجارة سواء كانت مملوكة بالثمن أو بالمنح لابد أن تزكى هذه الأراضي في كل عام بنسبة 2.5% كعروض التجارة في أي شيء ولا يعفى من الزكاة إلا الأراضي الضمار الأراضي الضمار هي التي فيها عيب في ذاتها لا تصلح 
للبيع بسببه أما الأرض الضخمة الكبيرة التي أملكها ولا أزكيها وأقول أنها ليست للتجارة أنا لست صادقا مع الله في ذلك لأنه لا يوجد شخص يتملك ملايين الأمتار للاستخدام الشخصي إلا يعفى القنية الشخصية لا يمكن أن أتحجج أنه ليست للتجارة وسمعنا بالأمس اقتراحات من أصحاب المعالي الوزراء ومن المتحدثين أنه قد يفرض رسوم وأنا أقول أنه نحن لدينا آلية مالية ليست مبتكرة فهي موجودة من 1400 عام عنوان الجلسة هذه الجلسة هو حلول مالية مبتكرة أنا الواقع وجدت أنه في تراثنا الإسلامي موجود حلين لمشكلة الأراضي البيضاء وهي التي تمثل العقبة الكأداء أمام الإسكان الحل الأهم والذي يجب أن يطبق سنوياً هو الزكاة الشرعية ولا يمكن لأي أحد أن يقول أن هذه الأرض ليست عروض تجارة ويجب أن تصدر فتاوى صريحة وواضحة في هذا الموضوع وأن نطبق الشرع الذي نفخر بأننا في هذه البلاد ولله الحمد نطبق الشرع فهذه الوسيلة سهلة وستجعل المدن تتمدد بالتدريج ولا نجد جزر بيضاء في المدن الرئيسية بقعة عمران ثم أرض كبيرة تعطل العمران وتؤثر على أسعار الأراضي وتكلف الحكومة مرافق أساسية وتجري الحكومة ورانا إلى آخر الدنيا بالمرافق الأساسية بينما الجزر الكبيرة اللي في أوساط المدن طالعوا في الرياض وطالعوا في جدة طالعوا في معظم المدن الرئيسية نحن عبارة عن بقع متناثرة الفرد لا يملك أن يتحكم في أرضه ويعطل العمران بهذا الشكل وسيد الخلق سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم عندما منح أحد الصحابة أرضا كبيرة وجاء بعده أمير المؤمنين الفاروق عمر بن الخطاب فقال لذلك الصحابي لقد منحك رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم هذه الأرض لإعمارها خذ ما تستطيع أن تعمره ورد الباقي وأعادها فلقد منح أفضل الخلق صلى الله عليه وسلم ولقد أعاد الأرض أمير المؤمنين الفاروق عمر بن الخطاب فلدينا الزكاة ولدينا الإعمار الحكمة في منح الأراضي هي للإعمار فمن لم يعمر فقد الحكمة الذي منح من أجلها وإذا كنا نطبق الشرع فيجب أن نطبقه في جميع مناحي حياتنا لذلك أنا أعتقد أن الإسلام نظر للعدالة الاجتماعية وللتنمية وللأفراد قويهم وضعيفهم ووضع كل الضوابط اللازمة لذلك فأيها الإخوان والأخوات يجب أن نتمعن في ديننا الحكيم ويجب أن نفهمه كما ينبغي وأن نطبقه كما ينبغي حكاما ومحكومين وأكتفي بهذا القدر وأترك الكلام لزملائي الآخرين That is in real estate terms. I, I cannot speak to the terms 
in Islam. But in real estate terms, what Sheikh Saleh just proposed is remarkable for Saudi Arabia. It's not remarkable for the developed world. In my hometown, a business will pay three or four or five percent of its real estate value every year as real estate taxes. Every year, I as a homeowner pay two percent of the value of my house as real estate taxes. If housing in America or the UK is developed for low-income people, it pays less tax. It can be an exempt purpose. If housing is developed for very poor people, it pays no tax. So it is in general a principle of developed economies that land which is used for business purpose is taxed. Whether that's in the form of tax or zakat, I leave to you, but I, I find Sheikh Saleh's suggestion, he's absolutely right. It's, it's a profound change that would have a profound impact on the creation and growth of Saudi Arabian cities. And so I commend you, sir, for, for suggesting it. Now, at the same time, we've heard before about the role of the banking sector. Um, and indeed, if developers and owners give back to the community, the banking sector no less gives back to the community. And some of the ways it accomplishes that is through private banks or partially government banks, or in the case of Thailand, a fully government bank. So my good friend Balab Kritayanavaj, the senior vice president for government of GHB, will explain very briefly how the Thai government housing bank evolved from a purely governmental entity to an entity that even though it is owned by the government is highly entrepreneurial and highly commercially successful. So Mr. Balab, the floor is yours. You can do it sitting or you can do it standing. Take your choice. Thank you, David. Uh, your Excellencies, distinguished participant, ladies and gentlemen, I am very much excited to be here for the first time in the glorious Islamic Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the land of origin of Islam and the spreading of Islamic civilization throughout the Middle East and various parts of the world, including Thailand. Uh, Thailand uh, have about 10 million Muslim. Uh, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Sheikh Saleh Kamel for inviting me to be here in the growing and prosperous city of Jeddah, the gateway to the holy city of Makkah and Madinah. It is in my pleasure and honor to be a part of Cheddar Economic Forum today to share our experience on housing the growing population, which is very timely and important issue. Since the provision of adequate and affordable housing has been a growing challenging issue for many countries in the MENA region, including Saudi Arabia. Thailand is a mid-sized country in Southeast Asia. The present population is about 67 million, more than twice of Saudi Arabia. Uh, during the past decades, Thailand's population growth uh, has slow to less than 1% per year. However, population in the urban areas increased very rapidly at the rate more than 4% uh, per year. Uh, firstly, our urbanization rate is about 45% compared to only 30% in 1990. Thailand economy grew impressively to 
percent last year, and we continue to grow at more than five percent this year. The GDP per capita is about six hundred uh, six thousand three hundred U.S. dollar, which is uh, nearly four times uh, less than Saudi Arabia. However, uh, Thailand enjoy one of the both lowest uh, unemployment rate uh, at less than one percent at the present time. Thailand used to face with a huge housing shortage and a large number of slum housing, particularly in Bangkok metropolitan region. However, we have overcome this problem. Uh, Thailand has successfully provided adequate and affordable housing for the last two decades. Our government has uh, always focused its policy on providing affordable housing, especially to lower and middle income group of people. Thailand homeownership rate is currently about 80 percent, one of the highest in the world, compared to uh, 67 percent in the U.S., 65 percent in U.K. Yeah, and uh, we currently have no serious housing shortage or housing uh, backlog or shortfall. Unlike uh, many other countries in the MENA region, we even uh, experienced the huge oversupply in Bangkok metropolitan region during uh, the uh, year 1995 to 1997. Uh, at that time, you know, we, our bank conducted research and found that more than 300,000 units were sold to the, to the home buyer, but it's what, what can. No, uh, uh, nobody uh, occupy them. So uh, housing in Thailand have, uh, uh, have been provided by both government and private sector. During the past uh, four decades, the National Housing Authority is the key government agency that produces affordable housing to mainly uh, low-income group of people. Uh, a total of 800,000 units, low-cost housing units, uh, were completed uh, since its uh, uh, establishment and readily available uh, market housing is on way on sale to all income group of people. Most of them are provided by private developers uh, purely on commercial basis. Housing development in Thailand are very efficient in producing housing uh, for sale uh, in the market. During the past, uh, during five years boom, booming period of 1993 to 1997. Private housing could complete around 800,000 units in Bangkok alone, an average of about 160,000 uh, units per year, equivalent to 40 years production of the National Housing Authority. New housing unit completion were adjusted to about 500,000 units during uh, the last uh, five years, reflecting a more balanced market uh, demand and supply. The Thai housing developers are currently, they are afraid of oversupply rather than uh, 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 inadequate demand. Actually, they can produce any number of housing units that the buyers demand or uh, they can uh, effort to buy. Currently, there are about uh, 1,000 1, housing developers operate in Bangkok metropolitan region. One of the uh, big uh, companies uh, announced this year to produce uh, more than uh, 10,000 units. And another company, yeah, uh, they pronounced to build uh, 80 projects nation nationwide. 
As for housing finance, I would like to say that uh, Thailand financial system is very supportive to home ownership. Many loans, uh, home loan to GDP in Thailand is uh, currently about 20%. And uh, home loan to on loan is about 16%. Housing finance system has operated very efficiently. Home loan outstanding expands steadily at the rate of about 12% per year during the last decades. Home loans are always available, accessible, and affordable to all income group. Private uh, commercial bank and the government housing bank are the two key lenders in the Thai housing finance system. They are compete fiercely in providing home loan to the Thai uh, home buyers. Currently, commercial banks uh, have the market share about 60 percent, where the government housing bank uh, about 31 percent. So the last uh, in, uh, individual uh, 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 holder of mortgage loan in Thailand. Jet Bank was uh, established 60 years ago in 1953 under the Ministry of Finance as a special purpose uh, financial institution. The bank has played a key role and in providing affordable home loan to middle, low uh, middle and low income uh, family. The bank uh, received no government subsidy from the Ministry of uh, Finance. So we uh, have to compete with other banks in both funding and lending in the free fini uh, financial uh, uh, market. However, the bank has successfully mobilized funds from the uh, general public to continuously expand its market lending to home buyers throughout the country, helping more than um, uh, many millions uh, to have their own home. Clearly, the bank is uh, serving more than 1.5 million families nationwide through more than 100 branches. The bank offers home loan to all income group. However, we con Centered on low-income family. More than 80% of on the bank account are less than 1 million baht or equivalent to about 1,025,000 uh, uh, Saudi real, which is considered as low-income loan. The overall average house price in Bangkok for sale in the market is about uh, 360,000 Saudi real. Why government ha housing bank average price used as collateral for mortgage loan is only uh, 175,000 real. The government housing banks provide the lowest lending rate to uh, home buyer compared to any other, other uh, commercial bank. Uh, but our depositing rate normally higher than commercial bank. As such, the bank still operate profitably. Uh, the bank is also the uh, uh, leader in extending loan repayment period up to 30 years and increase uh, loan to value ratio up to 90% uh, on 100%. Uh, That's mean uh, down payment only 10% uh, or no down payment. Uh, this is to assist low-income home buyer to better access and afford uh, uh, a home loan throughout the country. Thank you. I was struck in Balab's excellent presentation, and I apologize, Balab. Time does press, no matter how much we try to stretch it out how GHB, though it is a government bank, has no monopoly. It competes with private banks. And indeed, it is not the dominant bank in the marketplace. It's only 31% of the marketplace. So it's competing, I suspect, by expanding the frontier of lending downward, by, by using its government borrowing power for lower rates taking a little more risk with a higher loan-to-value ratio, and in general, expanding the supply of buyers. And it is doing that 
it's worth underscoring what Balob said, with no direct government subsidy. So in light of that, Dr. Saeed al-Sheikh, what is the state of finance in Saudi Arabia? What is commercially viable? Where does affordability lie? Do you want to speak up here or from, the, from your seat? Uh, I can speak from the board. Okay. So Dr. Dr. Saeed al-Sheikh, Chief Economist, National Commercial Bank. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. David, thank you very much, and also I extend my appreciation to the Jeddah Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to speak at this forum, this very important topic that we are discussing today. Just briefly, before I answer the questions that was put to me by David regarding financing options, especially as it relates to the Saudi banking sector, I would like to highlight few important issues related to the housing, especially as the determinants of the housing. We know that the population of Saudi Arabia is growing at 3.1%. The labor force is growing at 4%. Also, there is an improvement in purchasing power. The GDP per capita is reaching $24,000 per capita. Also, we're noticing a cultural change, a shift in the family size. People are shifting from the extended family to a single family. That in itself is a creating demand uh, on housing. So these issues are very important as we address the issue of housing. And I would come to the issue of affordability. And as we know, and as Sheikh Saleh has mentioned early, the cost of the land is constituting a large component of housing. It accounts for nearly 50% in cities such as Jeddah and Riyadh and even more in some locations. Uh, even in smaller cities, it reaches 30 to 40 percent. Worldwide average is 20 to 30 percent. In the U.S. is close to 30 percent the cost of the land. So the cost of the land is making it very hard for people to own their houses. We are aware that the official figures put home ownership at 60 percent. And this is the figure that was talked about yesterday, was published by the CDS, but I have my doubts on the validity of this number. If we exclude, if we exclude the mud huts and also clay homes, which also available in the CDS data, then the home ownership of legitimate housing or standard housing would account for nearly 40%. Also, if we look to the inflation over the period between 2008 and 2012, rising at or averaging at 12.4%, that would indicate immediately there is a huge shortage in supply, and it cannot be that the home ownership stands at 60%. So these are important issues. Now, I mentioned GDP per capita when one, one had to look at the average wage. GDP per capita is not a reflection with dis of disposable income. If we look to average wage of Saudis based on uh, official data released by the General Organization for Social Insurance, the average salary is a monthly salary, is about 6,000 Saudi rials. So we're talking about nearly 70,000, the average annual income. Now, if we look to the cost of the house, the average cost of the house is about 600 to 700,000. So we're talking about cost of the house to the annual income of tenfolds. If even if we, ad, if we account for a lower dependency than the average home size from 6.2 to nearly 4.4, if we account for that, meaning there is a second generator of income in the household, even if we account for that, that will bring the annual income close to 85,000 Saudi rials and will put the cost of the house to the annual income close to seven to eight times. In the U.S., the cost of the house to the annual income is close to three times, so there is a huge gap. Let me just now highlight the financing requirement. How much financing will be needed in the period between now and 2022? We're estimating there will be a need for 2.4 million housing units with a total cost of 1.3 trillion Saudi rials. Assuming the historical trend where people use their, their saving as well as relying on the real estate development fund with some acceleration in the funding provided by the 
uh, real estate development fund, the total investment, or as it is referred to as the gross fixed capital formation in the period between 2012 and 2022 will account for nearly 650 billion Saudi rials. If we add the 250 billion Saudi rials that were provided for by the royal decree of last year, then the total investment that would be available is close to 900 billion Saudi rials. So we're falling short by nearly 400 billion Saudi rials between now and 2022. Obviously, the banks had to play a role, and there is great opportunity for banks to provide financing, especially with the release of the mortgage laws. In the second quarter of 2012, just in the anticipation of the release of the law, financing or funding by banks increased by 17 billion. Residential finance amounted to nearly 48 billion Saudi rials by mid-year uh, last year. We're expecting total financing by banks to be reaching 115 billion by 2015. There will be uh, an acceleration of funding. The schemes that are available by Saudi banks now, I'm talking about the financing schemes, Ijara, which is preferable by banks as well as uh, by uh, clients or by households. They found that to be uh, more comfortable to them also with the promise of owning at the end of the period with the settlement of the whole uh, debt. The range for EJAR, the, the, uh, the cost of funding for EJARA is close to 3%. Uh, Murabaha has been introduced by some of the banks and just recently by NCB was uh, introduced in providing funding uh, for housing. It goes up to 20 years. As you know, the Murabaha is a sort of a markup arrangement where the bank will buy the house on behalf of the client and then will sell it to the client with a markup taking care of the deferred payment, the insurance, and other, other fees uh, and services. The rate that is available in the market now is averaging 4.5, 4.75. Obviously, this is high. We're expecting with more players coming in the market to be you know, falling lower. This is a fixed rate, uh, 4.5 to 4.75. Not all banks uh, offer actually this uh, product. Now, if I have time that I can reflect a f more, two minutes, yeah. Uh, now, if we look to the, you know, uh, housing issue and availability of financing to different income groups, I would identify the market in terms of three uh, different income groups, low income group, obviously those will be relying more on direct funding provided by the government through the 250 billion Saudi rials that were offered through the royal decree with the building of 500,000 housing units. Unlikely for those people to be access accessing funding provided by banks because of the cost of funding and because of the cost of houses. Now, for middle income group or low to middle income group, more likely they will be utilizing the real estate development fund, uh, especially that the uh, loan uh, uh, had been increased to 500,000 Saudi rials. More recently, uh, more recently, real estate development fund realized that the cost of the house is higher than 500,000 rial and introduced what's called the Vamen Vamen uh, funding, it's a supplement funding above the 200, above the 500,000 Saudi rials provided by banks, assuming the asset is mortgaged by both the real estate development fund as well uh, as uh, the bank. And this had helped a lot of people to access bank funding along with the real estate development, development funding. And even real estate development made it much easier to make their payments falling after individuals satisfy their payments toward the banks. Now, the mid to high income more likely will be benefiting from the mortgage laws that have been released. And we know that the regulatory measures uh, have been released, or three of them, three, for, three regulatory measures have been released. 
the real estate financing, the real estate leasing, and also the control and supervision regulatory measures have been released. I reviewed these. I found them to provide an important and a significant balance between the interest of the clients as well as the interest of the institution, the financial uh, institutions. We're still waiting on the mortgage regulatory measures to be released, an enforcement law to be released, which are the most important one to make the first three implementable. With the mortgage and with the enforcement, definitely there will be much more comfort to the individuals as well as to the banks in moving with you know, this such transaction when it comes to, to have the title of the house in the name of the client, but given that this is mortgaged and the individual will not be able to uh, sell or to do anything until the full payment uh, is settled. There are, of course, many details related to these uh, uh, regulatory measures that have been released. I'd be very happy to answer any of those uh, during the Q&A. Thank you very much. I come from a background of working for bankers and doing financial transactions. And so where a, uh, a social reformer would hear a 50% land price of housing and say that's very high, and a uh, affordability advisor would say that if homes cost six times or seven times or 10 times your annual income, that's very unaffordable. I also hear the statistics about how many billion rials it will take to finance all of this new development, and I say there must be a financing opportunity in here. The prior panel focused on the development opportunities and the fact that people do have money to invest and they do have money to spend for housing, provided you give them a housing solution. But we have to connect this all together. We may have all the oil in the world, but we need pipes to make it flow to the surface so we can use it to generate energy. And those pipes in the financing world represent value chains, and they need to be connected up together. And I can think of few people better to connect them together than the head of transaction and advisory services for Ernst & Young EMEA region, Mr. Phil Gandier. Phil, can you make the money flow for us, please? Well, I'm an accountant, and everybody knows accountants have no money. So thank you, David. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's good to be back with you. His Excellency, the Deputy Prime Minister of Turkey, said this morning in his keynote speech, even with adequate liquidity and demand and supply, that without confidence, without confidence in the systems, banks don't lend, so investors can't invest, and consumers cannot or will not buy. Uh, I've lived in Saudi Arabia now for 20 years. I moved here when I was three. And um, over that period, I have seen massive, massive amounts of liquidity being mobilized by not only the public sector, but also by the private or private and public sector on large infrastructure projects. And I've seen, for example, completely private projects go ahead and there'd be a lot of demand for these, if you think of some of the privatizations of, of government organizations. Massive demand to bid for these. I've seen IPOs that are oversubscribed 10, 20, 30, 40 times, but I've seen some IPOs that have really struggled, and I've seen a lot of projects that are announced that don't go anywhere. And I'd have to say, maybe a similar theme in all of this is one of confidence. When there's confidence in a project, there's massive demand and it happens. When there's confidence in an IPO, there's massive demand and it becomes oversubscribed. So what I'd like to do is maybe look at a specific problem on the financing side. And I don't want to get too tied up in a, in a, in a chart, but if you look at the chart behind me, so what you have is on the top is the developer and uh, so, so on the top is the developer, and if you think of someone developing a project, it starts very slowly in the first phase. They start spending money on feasibility and on some planning things, 
and then there's a big, oops, there's a big ramp up and they acquire the land and they start to construct and then eventually they start to sell, say that's affordable housing or any type of housing project and they start getting some of their money back. Maybe there's even pre-sales and they get it back earlier. But somewhere in that red circle, they're going to need financing. And if, they, if they, they can't see that financing coming in, the project's not going to go ahead. And similarly on the bottom, now you've got the demand side and that's the consumer who's going to be the off taker, who's going to buy his houses. But there's going to be no demand for his houses if the consumer, if there's no confidence in the consumer and he can't get a mortgage because the confidence is not there that he's going to repay that loan. So what I've seen in working with private sector developers who projects can't get off the ground, we have two problems. We have one, the, they, they're having trouble getting financing from the banks because there's a lack of confidence that their project is ultimately going to be sold. That if they're producing 100 houses or 1,000 houses, there'll be enough demand, there'll be enough citizens who can get loans to acquire those houses. And similarly, it gets down to the confidence that can these consumers <coughs> afford to pay back a loan if the banks give them a loan. So again, it's a little bit of a, of a confidence game. And, and for the sake of time, I was going to go into a little bit of a case study, but I'll just describe the Canadian experience to you, if I could. Uh, there's, in, in 1945, when the veterans were returning from World War II, you had tens of thousands of veterans that were coming back, coming into the cities. You had a massive urbanization type problem, and all of these people needed affordable housing. And some of them could not afford to pay like others. So that doesn't sound too unlike the situation in Saudi Arabia today. Massive urbanization, a lot of people seeking to have affordable housing. The problem was that the banks at that time were reluctant to give mortgages because these people weren't seen as a safe people to lend to. So something was developed by the government called the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And what it did at first is not so interesting, I think, to the kingdom because you've got similar organizations. What it did at first is it started lending. But the government can only lend so much. What it really wanted to do is get the private sector into lending, but the confidence wasn't there. So just an idea I wanted to respectfully drop to the advisors and the government and the regulators and everyone involved in studying the housing issue here is the, the next thing that they did. So in the 1940s and going into the 50s, they provided the financing. And what they also did is they demanded a fairly high down payment. And if you couldn't afford a down payment, they had a separate part of the government that would provide subsidies and, and other things to help that 5 or 10 or 15 percent. But the bulk of the people who wanted to have a loan, they provided that financing. To get the banks involved, what they did is they started a mortgage insurance company. And the mortgage insurance company was there to say to the banks that every single person in Canada who buys a house at that time and today, their mortgage has to be insured. And what that means to the banks is that if that, something awful happens to that person, that person goes bankrupt, banks don't want property. They don't want to take the property back. They're not in that business. They want their, their, their money back. So the insurance company would repay the bank on behalf of that person. So the mortgage insurance company was there to insure every single mortgage so all of a sudden banks were more than happy to get involved in lending. So that in the 60s, the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation got completely out of the lending business because there was ample amount of uh, bankers there willing to lend. And they spent